Welcome to our webinar on art for climate justice. So my name is Kenesha, my pronouns are they, them, and I co-lead the RAD program at Youth Climate Lab alongside Ray. So we're so excited to welcome you all tonight. And just before we get things started, I wanted to take a moment just to ground um, ourselves and share who's in the room. Um, so for those of you who are comfortable with sharing, if you can add in the chat your name, pronouns, and the traditional lands that you're calling from. If you don't know the name of the nations that steward the lands and waters that you live on, feel free to use the link in the chat, which is native-land, uh, to be able to figure out um, whose lands you're currently on. And as we name the lands that we live on, I want to encourage you to reflect on this quote by Naomi Sayers on the slide. It reads, if you're not an indigenous, if you are a non-indigenous person and think that land acknowledgements aren't enough or you want to do something more or better, start describing your relationship to the land. Where did your family come from? How did you end up here today? What did you benefit or gain or lose? And we're all truly people living on stolen land. And personally, for me, one of the things that I like to think about is also the traditional names for the land that I live on. Currently, I reside in Adawe, or colonially known as Ottawa, and I think it's really important to understand that the language that we use has a lot of value and importance. So learning traditional names for water, Nibi, I live right by the Ottawa River, which is part of the Kitchissippi watershed. And so taking time to really um, like put in that effort to understand the land and the people who stewards the lands that I live on. Awesome. So tonight's webinar is the second of our five part webinar series for the RAD cohort program hosted by Youth Climate Lab. So the RAD cohort stands for Research, Activate and Deepen fosters youth-led radical collaboration and climate justice approaches to achieve the sustainable development goals. Through the RAD cohort, youth are equipped with the skills, resources, and connections to transform their communities in ways that are collaborative, intersectional, creative, bold, and relevant. And if you want to learn more about the RAD program, we'll put our website in the chat. Um, today's webinar is going to be around an hour and a half long. We have four amazing speakers who are going to tell us all about their creative and artistic work, uh, followed by a panel discussion on the power of art for climate justice. And again, just some notes that we have about accessibility and engaging in the session this evening. We do have auto captioning, so this is enabled for the call so that you can have um, the words written at the bottom. So that's just by clicking the three dots at the menu of your Zoom screen and clicking on auto caption. And during the panel, we ask that you keep your microphone muted um, and feel free to have your camera on or off. If you have questions for any of the panelists as they're speaking, we just ask that you use the chat and I'll be jotting those down so that we make sure that during our question and answer discussion of tonight's session, um, that we'll get to those questions. So they're not ignoring you. We just have a specified time for that after their presentations. Um, and if you'd like to ask a question anonymously, feel free to directly message me or Kanisha. We're both YCL staff members. Um, and so we can put that into our document and just ask it anonymously. Um, and if you have any tech issues or accessibility questions or need any other sort of support this evening, please feel free to message us um, and we'll work to find something that works for you. And getting excited about our first speaker who is Monica or DJ Rumbolt. Um, so Monica is an Inuk visual artist with mixed European ancestry from the southern region of Labrador. From a young age, she has had a passion for creating art that represents her culture and love of land. Many of her works are based on traditional practices and use natural materials such as fur, seagrass, labradorite, and handcrafted paint from dried flowers and berries. 
Her most remarkable work sits in the Human Rights Museum in Manitoba, a dedication to her mother and the missing and murdered Indigenous women's movement. She now spends her days in Western Labrador with her spouse and a little girl, and little girl, Abigail. Her business now provides land-based experiences and teachings from the region for those who wish to learn more about the Indigenous people of Labrador. Um, and we'll have uh, Monica speak, um, and you'll notice their beautiful artwork in the background of their Zoom screen this evening. So welcome. Uh, good day. My name is Monica. Um, calling in from my traditional territory here in Labrador. It's the home of the Nanatsiavut Inuits, uh, the Mushwa and the Skapi Inu, and of course the Nanatuavut Inuit. And I also want to acknowledge our um, our sister island <laughs> newfoundland because i feel you can't talk about one territory without talking about another because they're both very beautifully interconnected and that is the home of the enigma and the beothic so yeah i let's let's get into it i'm super super excited to be here today especially speaking about art in regards to climate justice beautiful beautiful panel discussion so I guess um, just to kind of keep it quick, I got a neuro spicy mind. So somebody please cut me off at the 10 minute mark. <laughs> um, how did I come into art? I feel this is always an interesting question for me because much like culture, if you grew up in those surroundings, you don't, you're not necessarily introduced to it. It feels like it's always kind of been a living Thing for me um are there many artists in my family oh my gosh absolutely not not the way that's perceived today so I am the only uh, multidisciplinary artist but I get a lot of my teachings a lot of my inspiration actually from my grandfather uh, we grew up very poor isolated fishing community um, that's pretty much the standard um, in that part of the region and he was always <laughs> I say he's probably one of the most eco-friendly men out there, especially for like his age group um, where they couldn't afford or couldn't even have the possibility of getting things shipped in just because of like the ice and the storms and things like that. Um, he was very suave when it came to taking things and repurposing them. Um, so he would go and he'd tear apart a car, take the motor out, and he'd build like his own smokehouse, his own community smokehouse to do smoked salmon and char, or maybe like an old refrigerator that he would take and he would use um to help with the, you know, the skinning of martins and stuff, place to have them stood up. He was he was very, very smart. So I feel like that type of ingenuity that type of creativity really stems from him and that's kind of how I really got into art and to be able to express myself and take all these different um, things that I can find whether out in the natural world or here here in the um, here in town and, and just really make it my own so trying to go by the questions they gave me <laughs> <laughs> I hope you weren't looking for anything too professional. I, I come as I am. <laughs> so it's interesting because I talk about having that inspiration being younger. And I feel like that really fueled me into conservation. Right. So I seen my grandparents. I seen them um, working within the natural world. I said they were fishermen. They were hunters. Um, we go and we pick gallons and gallons of bay capitals, hence why I've got bay capitals everywhere here, or epics, depends on where you're from. <laughs> and it really struck a chord with me because we talked about conservation. I grew up in a time um, where we had harvested caribou. And during that time, there was no real regulations on how we harvested caribou. So you could get 12 tags for 12 animals. They were transferable. So I could end up getting 40 animals 
um, for myself and a bunch of people, there was a lot of waste. And what happened at the peak of this is that we started to really cut down the herds of that time. So they went from being almost nearly a million animals, this healthy, beautiful caribou herd, um, to just thousands. So the province had put a moratorium or a ban on hunting caribou, and it really impacted our our lifestyle, our our way we perceive food, the way we had access to food. Again, if you're coming from a very low income family, a box of shells and a bit of gas seems more manageable to fill your freezer full of good country meat than taking that same amount of money and bringing it to a grocery store. So I guess being able to experience that in myself and coming from a family where you utilize everything. I mean, I don't know anybody else's grandmother here, but mine keeps every butter tub she has. Washes them out, stacks them in the cupboard. That's Tupperware, baby. <laughs> and I mean, it's all jokes, but thinking about it, I mean, their approach, yes, was financially motivated, but they were so great at being conservationists, at realizing that we don't have a lot of resources and that we have to respect the resources that we have. So when we talk about this from a cultural standpoint, some people are like, oh, you know, but that's not like your, like your traditional culture. I, I think it is. I really think it is. I mean, we go by the rule of three, right? When you're out and you're hunting or you're gathering, I mean, you take what you need for yourself, you leave some for the next person, and then you leave enough so that it can come back again in the new year. Berries, eggs, animals, it doesn't matter. So conservation from that standpoint also feels super cultural to me because again, when we talked about harvesting, it was never more than what you needed. It was never more than what was going to sustain you and your family. So if you look behind me now, um, I don't know if anyone's familiar, but that's actually caribou fur. That's caribou tufting. So part of my work now uh, <laughs> and like my, my activism, we'll call it activism, it's very passionately fueled is through um, engagement. It's not always going out and, and like fighting the man. That was in my younger years. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm after cooling down a little bit, but I found the most effective way um, to do that is through engagement and education. And it starts with our youth. It starts with our children because we have something and I'm 30, so I can still say that just just for this year um but youth have something that's so incredible that's so connectable that a lot of us as adults i feel we lose over time and it's just this cavern of empathy um youth just have this beautiful way of being able to connect to the world around them to be able to want to understand the world around them they crave that intimacy that connection with the lands the waters and the people and I think that when you talk about activism and you talk about impactful activism right because there, there's a huge difference impactful activism it really starts at creating that connection at creating um that empathy so i do that like as a conservation route with caribou tufting to teach about you know what life was like before how we kind of messed that up for ourselves and what can we do now in the future to ensure that people like my daughter um can go and they can hunt again to sustain themselves so yeah um besides that don't have much on the go <laughs> <laughs> I actually uh so I started a charity foundation here in Atlantic Canada with a few great friends of mine um the Olnoeg Indigenous Communities Foundation so I feel when we talk about art and activism we also have to talk about like philanthropy because it's the art of giving anyway um yeah besides that that's me take it away Ray <laughs> thank you so much 
I know that I was like taking notes. Like I think so much of what you said really resonated. I think especially the way you talked about like youth work and that craving to like understand the world around you and how, you know, that's the the core, you know. Um, but I thought that was beautiful. Thank you so much. I'm just gonna reshare our slides again quickly. Beautiful. And I get to introduce our next speaker, Yaz. Uh, Yaz lives on the stolen land of Turtle Island on the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe Waki, Wendake, Neon Wetsio, Mississaugas of the Credit Nation, uh, which is Treaty 13 territory. This is the land of indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island since time immemorial. They recognize the continuous impact of colonization globally. They honor the living ancestors who have been violently impacted by the Euro expansionist global project of anti blackness. They are always in solidarity with land defenders and water protectors, black and indigenous freedom fighters. They are a person who is trying to be in right relationship with this body, land, and community. They are a multidisciplinary and multisensorial artist. They are tangled and unbecoming. They are always decolonizing. They are divinely guided as a learner and maker. And beyond that, they are centering a practice of reflection, care, and emergence in the embodiment of their work. So I'm so excited to introduce you, Yaz. I'll let you take it away. Sure. Thanks so much for that introduction. Um, and nice to see both familiar faces and names and some new names and faces. Um, yeah, as Kanisha just shared, my name is Yaz. And um, yeah, I'm calling in today from Tuckeronto, um, which is Treaty 13 territory, as Kanisha just shared a bit more of those lands. Um, so yeah, I'm coming in today um, as someone who definitely did not consider themselves an artist. Um, growing up, I felt like I kind of was between that... Um, I guess that binary that sometimes is created in schools um, where it was like sports or art. And I was very much on the sporty side for a long time um, besides dance. Um, and so I like to kind of root my own artistic practice in both dance um, and play because that was the only other time I really did um, arts was in arts and crafts classes. Um, and then when I went to, or when I got to university in my undergrad, um, yeah, I, A, was not good enough to play on varsity teams at that level. And it was no longer like, I was like, sports are a no for me. Um, but I also, um, was really keen and interested in the arts because of the folks that I was meeting and the people that I was sharing space with. And um, as I kind of explored art and kind of got myself more acquainted, um, I created really good friends who are also themselves artists. So that was really exciting to be able to like learn from them in this very informal and relational way. And when we were in our like end of second year, early third year of university, um, we had been talking for those few years about the art space in Tuckeronto being not the most accessible, but that goes for a lot of art spaces. Um, particularly as like emerging artists, it feels like things for emerging artists, you already have to have somehow like have done 30 million things and you're like, what? I am supposed to be emerging. So we were like, you know what? We'll start our own art collective and that was probably the first time that I started feeling more like I had a place within art spaces. Um, and it was called the Humming Collective. And over the years of late 2016 to early 2021, um, we together um, kind of were able to create something just for fun, but as a way to kind of bring community arts into our homes and into the homes of others, as well as like offer publication for folks to have an easier access to get their, their work into the world. Um, so that was really energizing. Um, and during that time, we held workshops like zine, or zine making workshops um, and movie nights and film screenings and craft nights that were really exciting, not only because um, we were doing it 
ourselves but because we got to meet a lot of local artists through that um and this was all done on like no real budget because we did not understand grants back then and so um I like to share that because I feel that sometimes folks feel that they need a lot of money um and like institutions to be able to create things that you're finding gaps in in these um structures or in your community um but yeah we found at the time just kind of um trying to do things with materials that we already had and with folks that we were already in community and to be like hey if you want to play a live show like we're gonna hold it in our our living room and invite like 30 people out um and it was just a really great um and it felt really reciprocal at the time which was really lovely too because yeah, it was more than just like, hey, play this gig for exposure. It was like, hey, play this gig and you will will do a donation or like pay what you can and then you can have some of that money or some of that funding. And um, with the publication, we did quarterly pub publications, which was really cool. And at the time, um, we kept them digital because again, we didn't have the money for print. Um, and honestly, at that time, uh, we were more on the curation side, so we were editing and putting things together, but us as a collective weren't really publishing our art um, as individuals through the collective or just like as individuals in the world. Um, and so in 2021, our last year of operating, we decided to take on, as we knew our, our time would be coming to a close, we decided to do a last project together, which was on um, Kensington Market, which is where I currently live and where most of the um, collective was based at the time. And um, that was the first time that I started seeing the ways in which art had such a deep impact on social movements and the ways in which um, they're really intertwined and necessary. Um, and so during this project, we were looking at the way that COVID and gentrification were affecting the market, um, the small businesses, the longtime residents, um, just the community folks who needed to get their groceries or their their day to day livelihood in the market. Um, we took that time to interview folks to continue chatting and building relationship and um, it ended up being a really cool project. We created a soundscape and an audioscape, or sorry, and a visualscape to go together that merged some of these conversations and interviews into a more interesting light. And I think that project is when I kind of fell in love with soundscaping and realized that a lot of the skills that I had I just had uh, over the years built up were applicable to art, even though at the time I still didn't really identify as an artist. Um, so that was like a huge shift for me, being able to do a project um, with folks in, again, my community. Um, and when I'm thinking about like, what's my why or where does my inspiration or motivation come from? I think it has always been um, about relationships for me um, and being able to co-create uh, pieces. I think um, since 2021 till now, I've kind of somehow found myself to become an artist as like an individual post-collective. And um, in that time, what I found that was really helpful was reaching out to folks and and finding out like, hey, who are who are some space, uh, where are some spaces and who are some people that are actually values aligned in their art practice and have similar, um, yeah, just similar work that I want to be doing and how can I learn from them, stay plugged in. And I found that I like probably oversubscribed to too many like art collective and art gallery newsletters and it was a little overwhelming. I'm still on too many mailing lists, but through that, I found some really interesting opportunities to do um, the first residency, which was Art for Social Change um, uh, with an organization. Um, I think the organization is called Futures Forward. Um, and for that residency, I was able to connect collage making and understanding 
what does it mean to have just livelihoods? And for example, around like my love of co-creation and community um, for that project was able, even though it was a solo residency, being able to hold a workshop with folks and um, have their input and have the collages become what is the installation that was just built in a workshop. There was no previous experience needed. Um, yeah, it was a really cool way to both like explore really hard and heavy questions, but also, you know, have something where we create something as people who might not identify as artists. I think that's something that I'm really connected to. And over the last couple of years, I would say, or the last year, I would say, um, like an artistic thesis of sorts has been around waterways and water and the ways in which the body holds memory and thinking about embodied movement instead of dance. Um, because as I mentioned, I was a dancer when I was younger and that space can be super limiting and very strict and not aligned with how I am as a human. Um, and so really wanted to create and find more ways of movement in my own body. And now I've found it to be, um, my art practice to be something that I really can't like decouple from the rest of my being. Um, it's become a really beautiful outsource or yeah, outsource, is that a word? We're going with it. Um, <laughs> a really good way to outsource like grief, especially. Um, and be connected with community in these really um, meaningful ways. Um, and so I think the why for me is to be in relationship with folks and to be able to create through um, through grief. It's finding that joy in, in the grief work. I find um, creating something beautiful and inviting clay and inviting movement and connection has been really life-saving for me and a lot of folks that I get to co-create with. Um, and it's really cool to see the ways in which community arts can be such a powerful tool for connection, especially if um, folks don't share language or culture. Um, and just being able to sit at an art table and create something and see the the natural curation and the natural connection that comes through that just because we were sharing space is like so meaningful. So I'm trying to like, not only like make art more accessible for myself, I really want to really think about what does art mean and, and who is art for and who gets to call themselves an artist um, in a way that still honors craftsmanship and practice, but also does not gatekeep art from those who did not have access and don't have access. Um, so yeah, I think that's a bit about me. I will pause there because I don't remember when I started and I don't want to over talk. <laughs> but yeah, thanks for those prompts and I'm excited to hear from the other folks. Thank you, Yaz. I really loved hearing about like creating an accepting community of artists and making these spaces a lot less daunting to enter because I find even myself, I wouldn't necessarily consider myself an artist and a lot of those spaces do tend to feel like very exclusive. Um, so hearing about the work that you're doing to minimize those barriers and to really invite people into this is really inspiring to hear and like I could just listen to all the cool things that you do <laughs> for like the next hour um love so I really love learning about that and I think it's really neat to hear about like your past experiences giving opportunities to emerging folks to share their talents and then also create an environment of reciprocity and shared learning and space for co-creation and like exploration of new mediums I think that's like a really unique spin on like a lot of the traditional ways that I've seen art and activism so that was wonderful to hear about and now I'd love to introduce our next speaker who is Shalaka. Shalaka spent their childhood between cities in India and Dubai before moving to a neighborhood spitting distance from Ontario's largest mall. They now join from block two of the Hamaldin track, splitting their time on Treaty One territory. Trained as an urban planner and a practicing curator, Shalaka has worked across multiple roles, including audio journalism, 
in social innovation spaces and urban planning departments on roof roof rooftop gardens and farms. Shalaka currently works at the Blackwood Gallery, supporting programs as a part of Shalaka's independence curatorial practice. They are an emerging curator with the University of Manitoba's School of Art Gallery Visiting Curator Program, a member of the Relationships Reciprocity Exchange Collective at OCAD University, and an editor with Textile based in the Waterloo region. Shalaka's interests explore belonging, grief, public memory, and queer ecologies in the context of spatial positionality and critical geographies. They'll likely point out the names of weeds as you walk together, enjoying studying the menus of local restaurants, and they always order dessert, which you're after my own heart out with that bit. Dessert is the way to go. Thanks. Thanks, Ray, and thanks, Kanisha, and the Water YCL community for hosting this. Um, I feel like, yeah, arts and activism are um, an intersection that are, is so natural and inevitable, and it's really nice to have some space to sort of uh, share stories amongst what seems like all parts of, of the country. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's been lovely to, to hear from others as well today um yeah and and i feel like yeah coming how like how we arrive at the arts is such an interesting question um because it is premised on the idea that you have to train in it or um you know uh and and, and i've always found that really uh, like a hard truth to sort of swallow and so you know we don't we figure out our own ways to sort of navigate that way um, and so when our family moved to Canada, we didn't have a lot of community. It was a pretty isolating experience. And, and so a lot of questions around um, who belongs here? What does belonging feel like? Um, what are, you know, why, why are these all, all these roads named Victoria Street or, or King Street? Um, these were all sort of questions that I was observing as, as an eight-year-old. And so, um, you know, when it came time to think about school and, and those options, um, I, I chose urban planning as the sort of direction that I wanted to go in, um, thinking that it was a field that would sort of encourage these uh, curiosities around these questions. And I think a lot of critical geography definitely does, but the, the path that I took, um, unfortunately, did not fulfill those questions. It raised even more questions uh, for for me, and so it's around that time that I turned more towards community organ organizing around mental wellness, um, around environmental work, and inevitably the way that we um, were able to access these conversations with broader publics was through through the arts, whether it was poster making, um, whether it was gathering and having programming together. And, feasts to have conversations about these um, these big ideas that felt so unsolvable, but but um, how coming into community felt like a less isolating way to sit in those problems. And so I was thinking a lot about these questions of belonging and memory and how I could continue to sort of poke at them and think about them. And that's around the time where I decided to um, move into, into arts work after sort of being in the climate space for a little while. And for me, that meant doing a disciplinary switch through, through school. So it, I found me doing a pandemic degree where a lot of it was online, which was also an isolating experience, but opened up questions that I was thinking about since I was eight years old in a new dimension. And so for me coming to the arts, um, I found that just the place that I was in um, school was a way that I wanted to sort of renew my um, or understand that relationship. And for me, doing a bit more school was also related to renewing my relationship to school, where whereas my undergrad felt um, like a really frustrating experience, I knew that I had questions that I wanted to answer about the world and, and I looked to school to do that. Um, and yeah, it's been interesting because I also chose to go to school in a city that I didn't go to. And so it opened up a relationship to that city and its arts community, which I have continued to be able to um, 
be in a relationship with, which has been really wonderful. And so when we think about being being in the arts, I think it's, you know, a lot of folks have said it's about community, but it's, yeah, it's it's so much about the folks that keep those um, disciplines alive and, and contributing to those communities if you do choose to move. And, you know, since since sort of coming into the arts more, more professionally, um, I definitely will say there is a lot of burnout. There is a lot of um, struggle around um, feeling like you're not doing enough, which is really frustrating uh, because your productivity is not your worth. Um, and it's in those moments that I try to remind myself that arts making and, and the practice of um, being in the arts is sort of a portal to uh, different ways of problem solving and alternative problem solving. Um, I think about this time where I was just really not unhappy with um, the way that I was thinking about school and just yeah not in a place that was particularly positive and I happened to go to the gallery um, to a gallery with a, with a friend and um, there was this wall with uh, paintings by an artist named Brenda Draney that depicted different scenes from her childhood and her life all alongside one another on these sort of like scrolls that kind of fell from the wall and there was um just the sense that she was able to um you know sort of communicate from her work where all the different timelines in her life had sort of come together to help her realize something pretty important and I, there was just something about that that reminded me that um yeah, every day is a new possibility and there's a lot and, and you know, we can author our own possibilities as well. And there's been so many incredible moments like that uh, with going to galleries and seeing what artists are thinking about and who they're in conversation with that have continued to open my mind about the different portals that they're thinking in and connect me to thinkers that, you know, are no longer alive, but um, we're still sort of hanging out, whether that's reading a book or a catalog or hanging out at a gallery. And that's something that try keeps me inspired more than I think it does. And I like revisiting that, that as a, um, yeah, as, as, a, as a memory for myself. Um, and I think about, you know, what kinds of places and people um, and histories are influencing this work that I do. And um, I should say, I, I mostly work uh, sort of with research and curatorial work. Um, curatorial work is research. It's also being on the world's largest scavenger or treasure hunt. And through these roles, I think what I would love for people to experience is just different observations about um, moments that, you know, otherwise might pass them by. I worked on a project this summer in Parkdale where we had an incredible DJ and we had a community member uh, make momos and it was a garden celebration and some people might say well that's not art well I would say that it absolutely is a way of bringing people together and um and and especially we had a photographer sort of document the 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 folks and their gardens and what they were proud about in their gardens that year and the stories and that is kickstarting a larger archival uh, project in that in that um, garden. And why shouldn't that be art? Why shouldn't the stories of, of people living their lives in abundant ways be considered art? And, you know, every time I pass by a community garden, um, I think about the different stories that are entangled in those raised beds. And um, it reminds me that it is an important role to continue to witness and bring attention to these um, these sort of seemingly simple moments. Um, and a project that I'm, I'm working on right now actually emerged out of me taking care of a kombucha scoby uh, or just a scoby to make kombucha over the pandemic um, or over the first few years of the pandemic, I should say. And, you know, I forgot if it was Monday or Tuesday, but it was, oh, let's check the SCOBY day. Oh, let's, 
flavor the kombucha and it was a different sort of time keeping that emerged and I was really thinking about how we could decouple ourselves from sort of the, the construct of the weekday and sort of rot those edges of time and um, that's a show that I'm, I'm working on that'll be in Winnipeg uh, shortly actually it'll open in November so there's anyone in Winnipeg let me know. I'll, I'd love to send you to the show. I'd love to meet you. Um, but yeah, just bringing attention to these these moments and sort of imagining alternative possibilities for these places and for the people who engage with these places is something that influences the kind of work that I, I do. And yeah, I think this work can feel really tiring, but can also be transformative in the ways that you can't you can't hide behind your feelings or you can't hide away from your feelings uh, when you do arts work. And the reason I say that is because whether you're an artist presenting your work work in the public or a curator putting words to um, the work that you're pulling together, um, it's a pretty public record of how you think and a pretty and and the way to sort of be in tune with that, I find is to, um, not get trapped in the uh, idea of being comprehensive and thorough, but just staying attuned and staying adaptable and staying open to continue to listen and learn from other, from the artists you're working with, um, from the folks that you're in community with and presenting with. Um, yeah, and, and realizing that it's so much bigger than you to, to be able to do creative work. Um, it can actually release some of the stress um, around this kind of this kind of work, um, and yeah, I think something that's been really rewarding has been the the project that was mentioned in, in my bio, the the publishing project based here on the Haldeman Tract. Um, we've been working a lot in a sort of like editorial and mentorship capacity, and I would argue that's 100% part of the work of curatorial work, um, which in its origin is centered around care. To curate is to care, to ensure that something has a life beyond the first time it's presented. Um, but, you know, it does come with responsibility. It does, it's it's a beautiful act, but it's it's one that is requires you to be accountable and responsible um, which I think can really strengthen community ties. And, and I think that's really beautiful. Um, and then, yeah, I, I don't know how long you've been going on for and I wanna make sure there's lots of time for, for questions and more conversation. But the last thing I'll sort of say is, um, I think I've mentioned this earlier that, you know, curatorial work and arts work can be like the world's largest scavenger hunt or treasure hunt. Um, and I wanna shout out an example in Winnipeg um, there used to be a pretty incredible Indigenous gathering space in downtown Winnipeg um, across from this parkade, actually, and um, it, it was it was up and running in the 70s and 80s and I think just slowly, um, you know, kind of disappeared from, from that landscape, but there's this like little piece of evidence that it still, you know, survives because um, the doorknob for this gathering space was an engraved bison. And um, the researcher I was working with and I on our first visit uh, working together in Winnipeg traced down this doorknob and it's now a pretty popular Chinese restaurant. And so it's just, um, yeah, a reminder to keep stories alive because they, give us our humanity again and um and yeah I don't think the folks who work there know this the story we've been trying to like figure out a nice way to sort of tell them but are kind of worried that they might get rid of the doorknob um but yeah just a reminder that you committing to keep stories of you your friends your community or your family is such important work um that that is um just worth doing constantly so um that's that's not like a project but it's something i'm really proud of um that has happened in the last little bit um yeah, yeah just stop off there thanks everyone thank you so much 
I was like, I don't know if you see me in the chat, but I, like, there's so many awesome quotes that you had about, you know, like all arts as an alternate, as a portal to problem solving, to curate, just to care, like saving those stories or conserving, or I don't even think those are the right words that I'm trying to go for, but I guess curate is the word, but curating those stories as an act of care. Um, I really love that. So thank you so much. Going to share my screen again. Um, and I'm excited to introduce our final speaker, Michelle Shie. Uh, Michelle is a community organizer, artist, and sociology undergraduate at the University of British Columbia. Her work weaves together climate and disability justice by building upon the rich traditions of popular education and fostering opportunities to engage in liberatory art making. She's the creator of the Water Damaged Paper Anthology, an independent justice-centered publication that celebrates the work of young emerging creatives. Michelle is also a facilitator with the Climate Justice Organizing Hub, coordinator with Climate Justice UBC, and Climate Resilience Lead at the UBC Climate Hub. Through and beyond these roles, she explores her interests in cross-movement solidarities, abolitionist praxis, climate well-being, and decolonial pedagogies. So thank you so much and welcome, Michelle. Thanks so much, Kanisha. I'm just gonna share my screen. Okay, can everyone see that okay? Awesome. Yeah, so like Kanisha mentioned, my name is Michelle, she, her pronouns. Um, I am calling in from unceded Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh homelands, colonially, colonially known as Vancouver, BC. Um, and I'm really grateful to be here and what an absolute honor it is to be sharing space with you all um, and to be part of an event with such incredible creative people. Um, I thought that I'd dedicate my time to sharing a bit about my artistic practice and the journey of discovery, inspiration, and community building that brought me here. All right. So I'm very lucky to have not only had exposure to the arts from a young age, but also opportunities to engage with art in so many wonderful ways, whether it was school projects or the local community center um, or the nearby art gallery, which had programs for kids on the weekends. Um, I developed a really deep curiosity about an interest in the arts. My mother often says that I sang before I really learned how to talk. And so um, music has always felt sort of second nature to me. Um, and that eventually led to me learning piano and violin at an early age. And then later um, I picked up guitar to start writing my own songs. Um, I was also part of my school's choir for, oh gosh, like eight or so years. And um, I sang as a chorale as part of the Vancouver Bach Choir as well. And that taught me so much about um, what it means to work collaboratively towards creating something beautiful. And um, it's a context where everyone's voice really matters and where you really need to pay close attention to other people in order to sing harmonies, um, in order to employ contrapuntal techniques like canons. Um, and so lots of appreciation for that formative experience of um, being in community with people. Um, eventually, I began to branch out and dabble in painting, sketching, photography, printmaking, collaging, and poetry, some of which I've included here on this slide. Um, these mediums became outlets for processing really complex experiences growing up and um, connecting with my culture and identities. Um, but it was also about finding joy. And an example of this is this um, in the middle here, the top photo is from um, a theater production in my high school. Um, it was during the time where I had written like one act plays and I was part of stage crew um, doing set design and stage lighting. Um, and for this particular performance, um, we were doing the Bard Youth Festival, which is a really cool program where young people are mentored by professional thespians and we perform modern adaptations of Shakespeare. So this picture is a dance battle that took place during our production of Henry V. So lots of fun. So while I was in high school, I began organizing with the Sustainability Teens, who are Metro Vancouver's um, youth climate justice movement. And one of our biggest accomplishments is that we mobilized over 150,000 people during the September 2019 climate strike, and it remains the largest protest in our city's history. 
Um, but beyond protests and rallies, we began to recognize the need for more creative interventions um, that were perhaps more accessible to folks and also meaningful in some ways instead of recycling the same techniques over and over again. So some of these photos, like in the upper right hand corner, um, we were hand cutting green circles from felt, um, and that was a sign of support for local climate action and justice. Um, on the left, sort of that middle photo is um, Funeral for Our Future, which was a staged memorial in front of the Environment and Climate Change Canada office, um, where people carried coffins to represent the lives and futures we were mourning as a result of government inaction um, and just generally the lack of bold climate policy that was being passed. Um, we also had Future Fest, which happened um, on Black Friday, and it shut down one of Vancouver's largest shopping streets to perform a flash mob um, to host a massive clothing swap as an alternative to overconsumption and fast fashion. Um, we had a really big collage board where people could come and imagine more sustainable and just worlds. And of course, there was music. Um, the sustainability teams also had the privilege of working with um, filmmakers Jamie Giannopoulos and Claudio Cruz to create um, What About Our Future, which is a documentary that captured our team's process of movement building, leading up to a number of big actions, including that September climate strike in 2019. Um, and something important that I learned is that um, through this work, climate justice doesn't always have to mean sacrifice. Um, I think that feeling joy and hope is super critical in sustaining our work in so many ways. And these sorts of creative interventions um, help demonstrate what these alternatives to our current systems um, look like and ones that are already being modeled and built from the ground up. Um, so yeah, art helps us visualize and imagine these possibilities, um, especially in a way that, um, you know, uh, like Sherlock mentioned, helps us move through grief and frustration and all these messy feelings that arise when we're living through these converging crises. Um, so when I started university, I got involved with the Climate Hub, and I currently work there as the Climate Resilience Lead. And one of our most uh, ongoing and prominent programs that we run is called YCAP, which is the Youth Climate Ambassadors Program. Um, and this really uses storytelling as a powerful tool for communicating and building shared knowledges around climate narratives. Um, I think that one of the most um, fulfilling things that has come out of being a YCAP facilitator has been um, seeing people connect with one another on an emotional level and just take that as a ramp um, to getting more involved in climate justice work because it's grounding the importance of this work in places of care um, and the care that we have for people and places. And oftentimes that can resonate more than you know statistics and facts about climate science. Um, also there on the screen is actually an upcoming project. Um, we're collaborating with the Hatch Gallery, which is a student-run art space on campus at the University of British Columbia. Um, we're designing a number of events surrounding artivism, which is the portmanteau of art and art and activism. Um, and this is in support of their climate catharsis exhibit, which is upcoming in February of next year. Um, and a lot of this work aims to use art not only as a way of sharing our fears and experiences with climate injustice, but also to celebrate the resistance and healing um, of being involved in organizing work. And um, yeah, I'm just really excited to create these low barrier opportunities to engage in art making um, in a community setting and to have discussions like this one um, around the role of art in change making. Um, and then sort of the last thing that I'll bring up is um, the Water Damage Paper Anthology. This was a passion project that I dreamed into being about four or so years ago. Um, it was in response to the lack of journals and magazines and general publications that were accepting work from young people, particularly those under 18. Um, and so this is a print and web-based publication that provides that platform for justice-centered writing and art and other forms of creativity. And the name speaks to the way that the voices of youth are often watered down and diluted. Um, we are told that we're not old enough to make a difference or that you know we don't deserve a seat at the table, even though it is our generation that is inheriting these crises. Um, so this project is a testament to how we are refusing to be silenced by that. Um, and it was really important to me that this was independently published. Um, it was very much inspired by radical histories of zine making and abolitionist presses. Um, in the way that they allow people to create um, beyond ways that are within the confines of industry standards. 
so that people can circulate ideas and document perspectives that might not otherwise be published. Um, and this was really a experiment in carving out, you know, our own spaces by not requiring a submission fee or not going through like rigorous judging processes of who can be included. Um, and at its core, it's a publication that centers the voices of marginalized people by writing ourselves into history. So the first volume was about climate justice, which is um, with the tides we rise, and then through love we unite is about intersectional feminism and queer and trans liberation. Um, and then the third volume was just recently launched this past month. Um, it's about disability justice, and it's a topic especially close to my heart as a disabled person, um, and especially as I begin to think more about the shifting nature of my artistic practice into more tactile forms of art, like pottery and embossing and non-visual forms of art um, as I lose my vision. Um, so if you're interested in reading this, um, or if you'd want to support and purchase a copy, I can paste a link in the chat. Um, all of the funds go back into community to support mutual aid. Um, okay, I will put the link there. There you go. Um, but yeah, it's been really amazing to see the reach of this project over the past few years. Um, it's, you know, on local library shelves and schools, um, bookstores and more. And really, this is an invitation to rethink who we learn from and also to feel hopefully energized about taking action on these various justice centered issues. So yeah, um, I will close off. I don't think that I have time to go into all of these, but these are some wonderful resources and sources of inspiration. Um, in particular, I really love um, Forever Chinatown, which is about Frank Wong, and he's a self-taught artist um, who makes miniatures about the places that he grew up in, I believe, San Francisco, um, specifically around Chinatown. And it does a, such a beautiful job of just capturing memories um, and the importance of preserving that for future generations, and also just to have a way of visualizing these um, changes in communities. So I'll paste a bunch of links in the chat, <laughs> um, and I'll do that um, after I leave. So, bye. <laughs> Thank you so much, Michelle. I mean, again, I was typing, typing, typing in the chat all throughout <laughs> as you were going. I think that. Uh, where you ended on about writing ourselves into history. I think that was just so, mm, I love that one. Um, so thank you so much. Cool. Um, so now we're heading into our panel discussion portion. Um, so for everyone watching, if you have questions, please submit them in the chat. We'd love to, um, to hear your thoughts um, and to pose your questions as well. So pop them in the chat um, as we go on. Um, while you're thinking, we'll start um, with one of our questions for our panelists. Um, so our first question is um, about art and activism movements. So, you know, as we know, art often gets minimized in activist movements, you know, as something that's purely aesthetic or something that's not suited to the urgency of the issues that we're facing. Um, so I'd love to hear in your perspective, you know, what is the power or the role of art in the climate justice movement? Um, yeah, I'll throw it to Monica. Do you feel like you want to start us off? Sure do. Okay, so it's a really complex question, but I feel much like everything, us young people, when we start off, and I see it so much with like new and emerging artists, is that we have to feel like we have to solve all the world's problems at once. Um, you know, go big, go home. That's the only way it's going to get done. And it doesn't help that we have like this whole, I use the word community just to make it simple. This whole community of people saying like the youth are going to save us. You know, they're going to turn the ship around. You got it. Most of us are still trying to save ourselves at this point. So <laughs> When I think of art and impactful activism, like actually being able to use what you're producing, what you're making, I always say small scale. Small scale is so important and it's so effective. So, for example, if you want to talk about like regional, right, it was a couple of years ago, probably about five or six, 
Um, the pipeline protests were happening on the West Coast. Here on the East Coast in my region, we were having a massive protest as well. Um, this new dam was being installed. It was going to damage a lot of waterways. Um, the environmental surveys were not happening. They were not being um, done ethically or correctly. So again, small scale, right? Regionally, what are we looking at? This is when some of the most impactful art came out of the community. Drum dancing performances. I know that Yaz talked about being a dancer and I thought this was so cool, but if you've ever seen Inuit drum dancers, uh, not typically like First Nations drumming, uh, there's movement, there's flow, right? And to be able to incorporate that with the movement of water, um, I just picture this young, young girl who stood in front of this huge police barricade. They were about to take everybody in. She couldn't have been no older than 16. And that's what she did. She did the dance of water. She drummed, mimicking the rapids of the falls. And she didn't make national news. You know, th this wasn't something that went and, and just entirely changed the world, but it changed our world people across Labrador seen this. They they seen this performance, this this active movement. And it was almost like a call to gathering, right? People became more interested in what was happening with the dams. There were more um public inquiries, more things going into the province office saying like, hey, listen, what is going on? We are concerned now. So right off the bat, like that for me again, it is that small impact that creates the largest movements, even if it's only in our backyard, that's still better than nothing. Um, and of course, from my own personal experience, yeah, <laughs> art is a call to gathering. It's it's funny because when we talk, and, and I say philanthropy because I do a lot of charity work too, like in funding and program development and stuff. And at some point, we started isolating art away from these other sectors. And it only makes sense, and I can't remember the other panelists that said it, but it's, it's they're so intertwined because they're on the basis of emotion, right? When you put something into a performance, into a piece, whatever the case is, that is emotion that you're putting into that, right? It's feeling. And I feel as like, and I say from an indigenous standpoint, as indigenous people, we connect emotionally, just, it, it's almost instantaneous. And it feels so hard to explain because of the colonized mind that we have when it comes to the processes of activism, right? It's you go in, let me get my, let me get my thoughts right here, right? You go in, you want to make instantaneous change. Sometimes that happens, yes. But quick change without thought or emotion put into it is rarely ever sustainable change. If you want people to care, they have to care enough to learn. That's the part that we're skipping over. They have to care enough to want to educate themselves, to want to better themselves, to want to push forward with the rest of us. I can't do this by myself. The more people that I have in my corner understanding the issue, understanding the feeling of the issue that we're trying to tackle, that's where it's at. So art as a tool for activism and engaging in that feeling, creating connection. I'm going to care about things that I am connected to. I want to learn about things that I care about that I'm connected to. I will advocate for those things once I feel a strong enough connection to. I do that through art. We've seen it um, with the mining companies here. When we want to talk about um, the development of new lands, talking about water, talking about conservation, whatever it is, there's always an art component because if you have that lack of emotion, I feel, again, as an artist and as somebody who's kind of 
been in this realm for a while over here it's it doesn't go far and it doesn't last long so i hope that made sense just on good vibes here <laughs> anybody else jump in those facts snaps all around <laughs> but i love to invite yeah shalaka and michelle if either of you want to jump in Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I think you spoke to a lot of the things that were on my brain as well, Monica, um, particularly around um, the way in which um, I think art, I the way I found myself in art anyways, is through it, you kind of eliminate, eliminate the barriers that come with organizing um that I don't know if folks here do do a lot of like organizing or activism there's a lot of unfortunately lateral violence and um just a lot of conflict that shows up that can often halt our process at least in my experience with climate organizing and anti-poverty organizing and I do find that through art workshops, art making, um, it's a, just a really beautiful way to gather folks. Um, and I think saying that like art is like surface level in climate movements is in and of itself just like mind blowing because um, so much of our, our current activism that we know and remember is because of the artists who were able to really make it so accessible and make it so tangible and rooted and I think art in and of itself came from a form of usually like resistance and as a form of creation and livelihood and so it's really been co-opted by fine art uh, spaces but I, I really do think that it is such a root source of how we um, yeah get things done and do it in a more sustainable way um, the practice of most art making is slow and it's that reminder in our organizing too it's usually relational again bringing that into our organizing um, and it often doesn't need like shared language or um, even shared like cultural or political beliefs so as ways to kind of bring folks together and unpack big questions that are hard to talk about but maybe we can express in different ways or maybe we can relate in different ways I find to be super yeah important so I'll pause there I love that and like how you said like the process of art making is slow and how that translates to our work too and sustainability love that um Shalaka or Michelle do either of you want to jump in yeah I'll I'll definitely say like something that we forget is is yeah really captured in what Yaz just shared that you know artists were sort of the, are, are some of the most important folks that sort of memorialize these moments of, of transformation and that's something that we can we're so um sort of indebted to in terms of um how they're sort of um supporting that memory work for, for generations beyond um yeah I think for me it really comes down to sort of just the reminder of our potential and collective potential and what we're capable of. Um, I, I see a question in the chat about sort of um, doing some uh, work with a local organization and, and planning for that. Um, and I, I just want to give an example that I feel like was really uh, effective recently. Um, uh, we had, uh, for, the, for the gallery that I work at, we had um, a partnership with a organization that was uh, showing uh, or, or providing resources for, for people who are experiencing gender-based violence. And um, that's a really heavy topic, topic to sort of take on on a university campus, uh, especially just through tabling. And so um, what someone, um, or sort of the, the, the tactic to sort of mobilize folks and to get them thinking about it was to um, have a screen printing uh, an artist whose who's medium was screen printing uh, creates two templates and, and sort of have folks practice screen printing signs for a march that would happen in a couple 
in a couple of weeks. And it was such an effective way to have people, you know, come come to this conversation with curiosity, ask questions about the community, realizing, oh, is this something that happens here? Um, get connected with resources and um, while still sort of uh, creating really supportive and beautiful, beautiful signage for, for an event that's that's really important. Um, and so that that I think, you know, um, was a way that we could literally see the impact of, of people's uh, engagement. But um, yeah, it was also something that was on my mind like so should we chat around some some tactics to incorporate in art. I love that. Think of like art as like an access point, you know, and a way to start with these huge topics and issues in our community. But, uh, Michelle, anything you want to add? Yeah, just echoing so much of the good stuff that's been shared so far. Um, I really think of community-based arts as one of the ways that we um, embody what it means to practice other ways of being in relation to one another. Um, and I think that it's also just hugely important for communicating demands of social movements and for um, the less <laughs> less exciting data visualization. Um, thinking of things like Ed Hawkins and his like climate stripes making the rounds on social media circa 2021 um, to show like rising global temperatures. That was like a really powerful way of you know visualizing that for a lot of people. Um, and also to recognize, um, like Yas mentioned, like the ableist and oppressive underpinnings of urgency culture. Um, you know, what happens when we don't value things that take time that come into being or leave people behind in that process. And so, um, yeah, art making is really, you know, underappreciated um, resistance work that's happening. I love that. And like practicing, like you said, practicing how to be in relationships with each other through art. I think that's beautiful. I want to jump to Tina's question in the chat here. Um, so Tina's thinking of possibly doing some sort of artivism, either for their university or hometown, like starting a local group associated with either the library or community center. Um, so looking for any thoughts on some ways of planning for that. Um, I'll leave it to any of our panelists who want to jump in first with any thoughts. I can speak a little bit to this just because, um, yeah, just did a bunch of that, especially in when I was an undergrad. Um, I think when wanting to start a group, really the only thing you need is like the people first and foremost. So knowing kind of what your source is going to be and what, what are your, um, yeah, I guess what you're you're planning for and the ways in which you want to go about it um, is super helpful. So thinking about the the themes that you want to center on as well. Um, and then I think often, at least I can speak for Tuckeranto, I'm not sure where you're based, Tina, but um, I find that the public libraries are super keen on working with folks and um, at least very least you can leave your um, posters there often um, and I find that um, when thinking about like universities there's usually a lot of um, resources within like your student life for like starting groups as well as just like doing one-off events and things like that. So sometimes it feels really overwhelming to commit to like, hey, we are this group and we're going to be doing this thing for X amount of time. So maybe even just starting off with one event and and maybe finding your folks there um, as a way to to kind of gauge um, to gauge like what the interest is even um, in the communities that you're in, I would say is like super helpful and to not feel like limited by grants or like funding again there's so much um not only like mutual aid but community source um funding that you can organize and and do through the various platforms for that like the classic go fund go fund me but i've heard mixed things about them and how they dispense their money so just researching like those different elements as well um and again you could always do like buy donation or pay what you can and knowing that like sometimes that means folks will 
pay just by their presence. Um, but I think, yeah, like maybe starting even just with one um, event or action or gathering um, can can lead to finding those people to really share the the work that it takes to do a consistent group and sustainable group. But those are initial thoughts. I'm sure other folks have some good ones too. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, I invite um, Monica, Shalaka, Michelle, if you have any advice on this, or just in general, how can someone start you know, doing community art and using their art for activism? I can jump in. Um, yeah, I can share two resources that come to mind. The first is an offering from um, Hannah Gelderman, I believe, um, and it's a guide to organizing collective arts for climate justice. Um, so there's some background knowledge on like what participatory visual arts um, and what climate artivism could look like, but also there's more questions surrounding like the logistical pieces and um, resources that you might want to consider as well. Um, and then the other thing that came to mind was the Climate Justice Organizing Hub, because um, this is a cross-nation network support structure. And um, if you're looking for folks to join things um, who might already be involved in like other forms of climate justice work, that might be a great place to start just to see who in your area might be interested. Thank you so much for dropping those links. Super appreciate it. Um, Shulaka or Monica, do you have anything you wanna add or advice? I have some advice and <laughs> this is like the program curator person with a little bit of interesting lived experience but all of these resources are wonderful absolutely go start it there can never be enough of that beautiful work in the world I just want to let you know though when you're building relationships and networks always be conscious of where you're holding space to you are imaginative you are creative you have so much to offer the world not everybody will take that and use it for what it is as an indigenous person there has been so many times where i have been in a space and i'm like yes i'm making impact in the space I was not, I was a placeholder. I was a seat holder. I was there specifically for what I was. I know it kind of puts damper on this great conversation, but I feel sometimes we have to be realistic and we have to let youth know ahead of time because we're all out there. We're all trying to make change. Not everybody feels that way. So, you know, go into it with a good heart, but also go into it with a good mind. Just make sure that the spaces that you're in are fulfilling you as a person, fulfilling your organization, your values, your morals, stuff like that. That's all. You're worth so much more. Snaps. <laughs> like mic drop, period. I think that's so important. Thank you. Um, Shalaka, were there any pieces you wanted to add? Um, I, I feel like everyone's spoken to some of the important dimensions. Um, I think really, yeah, coming off of what um, folks have been saying um, in terms of sort of taking care of yourself and uh, taking care of the people you're organizing this with, um, I think it's a really good exercise to think about the things that energize you, if it's, if it's just you working on this or if it's a group. Um, what energizes the group, but also ways that you find rest. Um, Cause you know, even, yeah, just building in a little bit of time to sort of reflect and think about how things went can, can really go a long way in terms of, um, yeah, giving you energy for, for the long run. Um, and also reminding yourself of, of your worth. Yeah, I love that, making space for rest and centering that. Cool. So um, I think just for time, I'm going to end with one more question for everyone, sort of a two-parter. Um, first, if you want to do any shout outs of like work you're doing or things happening in your community, we'd love to hear it. Um, and then ending, I want to know what's your dream for the future that you want to share? Um, 
So I'll start, maybe reverse it, maybe start with Michelle if you want to share. Sure. Yeah, this is always such a huge question because I feel like often we aren't given the space or necessarily like taught to be imaginative. Um, I think speaking to what a lot of folks have mentioned as well about making art more accessible for everyone. Um, I think that we've seen sort of how a lot of what people would deem as like hobbies or side projects um, get commodified in the sense where people are like, well, are you going to make that an income stream? And some people just want to make art because, you know, it makes them happy or some people want to just be in community and um, experience, you know, all of that. And so um, I think steering away from the whole like professionalization being the only pathway or only way of engaging in art is something that I dream of. Um, and also echoing what many people have mentioned of like not fully um, feeling even right now, um, like I can claim to be an artist and something that I hope people don't have to feel in the future as well, like to not feel that imposter syndrome of, oh, I'm not good enough or like my story isn't worth telling. Um, I really hope that that's something that, um, you know, I mean, I feel like it's given me a lot of hope to see that there is work happening to resist that notion as well. So. I love that. Beautiful. Uh, Shalaka, do you want to share? Yeah, I I love this idea of liberating art as like not just just a job or or like a way of making income. Um, I think, yeah, in the realm of sort of art and activism and what a dreamy space for that would be, um, it's to sort of I would say my dream is that people stay in touch with um, with yeah, the other realms of possibility and are able to enrich that curiosity in whatever way that might be, whether that's you know cooking together or um, going to a gallery together. Um, but yeah, I just I I know our days can be so full and so busy, but I think in a dream space. Um, and something that I always want to try to make reality, just really making time to, um, yeah, to prioritize people and, and one another. And um, I think that can go a really long way. I guess that's not really specific to art and activism, but I think, yeah, that is just like the standout quality of, of the world that I am excited for. I love that and feel that. Um, Yaz, do you want to share your dream for the future? Sure. Yeah. I mean, um, I think, yeah, the things that you shared, Shalaka and Michelle, have really resonated and are so aligned with things that I've been thinking about too. And um, yeah, I, I think my dream for the future would be. Um, trying to move away from disposability within our spaces. Um, and what I mean by that is, um, you know, figuring out more transformative justice practice in how we move through conflict um, and moving away from carceral systems um, into, I think someone in their bio had talked about like queer ecologies and care ecologies and that just meaning like our these these values are are so intertwined in our way of being that they become kind of like an ecology or that's how I think of it um and and yeah just for um yeah the spaciousness for folks to rest and um have time for play I think a lot of us don't have time for that or think we don't uh, which is valid but yeah I dream of a world where play is part of our everyday so yeah I would say that thanks I love that rest and play <laughs> yes. um, Monica do you want to share very hard question it's because it's so layered I think but all right <laughs> again neuro spicy brain guys you gotta give it a minute to just get in gear um dreams for the future so there's this really really interesting quote i heard um a couple years ago and 
it always stuck with me and it comes from Dr. Albert Marshall, who is a renowned uh, Mi'kmaq elder in Mi'kmaq. Him and his wife, um, unfortunately she had just passed away, but just beautiful, beautiful souls. Very, <laughs> very prominent in the activism world, indigenous activism. And he said to me one time, he said, in order to get things done and to actually get them done, to make them progress, to move forward, when we come together, we should only come with our gifts and not with our titles. So that stuck with me. And it hit a chord really, really deep in my heart because I think the one thing that we overlook, and I know a couple of people have mentioned it, and you guys, uh, to my other panelists, you're brilliant. I just love all of you. But oftentimes, it's uh, everything is a commodity, right? Um, even now, I find there's a shift, especially in social media, depending on what's happening, what's the hot topic discussion. Artists are kind of moving and forming in those avenues there's no time for play there's no time for you know just being able to sit and be with oneself and we often push our limits not in a way that helps us grow but in a way that leaves us that leaves us tired right we're we're trying to fill all of these spaces that society expects us to fill without really filling ourselves and that's coming with our gifts right i I'm I'm an artist, okay, yeah, but you know what I'm really good at? I'm really good at connecting with people and helping people connect with each other. That's a gift. That's a creator-given gift. I don't come into a meeting. I don't come into a rally. I don't come into a, a panel <laughs> uh, with my title. I come with my gift, and I think that's so important, and if I had to have a dream for the future, I wish more people would honor that part of themselves to be able to show up as they are with the magnificent talents that they are given and use those to solve problems art art is art is a tool art is a tool and when used properly it can do so much good in the world absolutely but we also have to understand that I don't have to change everybody's mind. I don't have to change my region's mind. Sometimes the best way to progress is to help change me, help better me. And if we've all worked towards that in whatever medium, style, uh, disciplinary, whatever, whatever, if we start with us first, imagine the amount of impact we can create going forward so I think yeah if that's my hope for the future it's just I want everybody to honor that part of themselves to explore that part of themselves and to take care of that part of themselves because that's where the real change happens for me at least that's where the real change happens so yeah <laughs> Thank what a beautiful note to end it on. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to pass it on to Ray for a few closing things before we close out this space. Yeah, I just want to say thank you to all of our brilliant speakers, Monica, Yaz, Shalaka, and Michelle. Um, quite honestly, this evening has just been so wonderful to learn and to listen to all of you and your experiences. I'm just like walking away with like a renewed sense of hope and like rejuvenation, which is like you don't often get in like the climate justice space. Um, so having that sense of hope has been just like really incredible to see this evening. And so we encourage everybody here to support and stay connected with all of you. Um, so I'm just going to drop some or Kanisha is going to drop some links in the chat so that you can check out all of the wonderful work that they're doing, whether that's on Instagram, websites, Facebook, um, so many cool things going on with these folks. And I also just want to thank 
our collaborators with the RAD cohort, the 4Rs Youth Movement, Wawanisa Insurance, and the Community Foundations of Canada, and our funder, Canada Service Corps, which is part of ESDC. Um, all of these individuals helped to make RAD possible. Um, and lastly, we would like to say thank you for coming to our second webinar, um, for being in the audience, participating in the chat, um, and to please stay connected with Youth Climate Lab, and we'll share our socials into the chat as well.